Thanks, Sarah, so much for joining me. I'd like to just start, kick it off by starting to motivate some of our somewhat spicy title. Um, I'd love to ask uh, for you to explain a bit about what mutualism is and how you came to this framework of thinking about uh, systems, good, public goods, commons, that sort of thing. Well, um, first of all, it's really nice to see you all. Um, I'm going to jump in with a definition of mutualism without any context, but hopefully we'll get to that. And um, I just want to say it was really interesting hearing Juan's talk just before when he was talking about what's the best way that you can get to some success, and it's by being connected to other people. And mutualism actually is the way, it's the operating system of how people come together, how they have in the past. It has three principles. It's a community. People come together because they have shared interests. Uh, they live in the same building. They're in a food co-op. They're in a union. Um, they, number two is that they have an economic mechanism. It's a self-funding community. You pay your dues. There are services. It's not like a big donor drops the money in. You organize the capital within that community. And the third is that it tends to have a long-term horizon. And you see that in unions, cooperatives, mutual aid groups, and the business of the faith communities, schools, insurance companies. And when you look at that as a sector, it's a trillion dollar sector. So this is not like a small thing. And uh, the, uh, the idea of a self-funded, long-lived community uh, that is aligned around goals seems to be very consistent with what a lot of people in Web3 are talking about with DAOs now. Yeah. And I, I have not come across anyone referencing these types of labor union, these types of existing communities that have been doing this for decades, if, if not set, like more, oh, at least more, the, more than a century. Um, are there... Uh, what are the most obvious connections that you see to some of these Web3 or DAO-like things that uh, would benefit from making that connection? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a great question, and it's really true. Like, I have to say that I am, like, the last person you'd think would be, like, a Web3 person, you know? It's, like, just not my cultural thing, but I... Oh, really and actually, it. sorry to interrupt, but I would love to... Uh, have you dig into a little bit more about your background, your career, and how you got to this, either after you're finishing that thought or as Sure, sure. And so basically, um, yeah, what a great conversationalist you are. So, <laughs> but the DAO to me is like, we are so at the early stage of this, like in three years, we'll look back at now and be like, that was so stupid. But it's like, <laughs> we're starting to really get smarter about it. But it is that idea of the collectivity and that it starts to have its own ecosystem there it's boundaried it is a group of people that are connected for a reason and it is not just an open thing and so i think those are the connections so let me just say i come from a labor family my grandfather was a vice president of the garment workers union in the 1920s and i my father was a union side labor lawyer my husband's a labor lawyer my child wrote a great senior thesis around labor, so you know it's the thing we do. But really, unions are about people coming together. They have a collective and an ecosystem. They have their own money that they generate. The union generates it through dues. You know, when I start describing this, it's like if I didn't tell you it was a union from the 1920s, you would be like, that's a really cool DAO. <laughs> so I think the big, and then I'll, and then let me just say, I then started the freelancers union. I don't know if anybody here was a member or is a member. Anybody here who remembers now? Yay, okay. Um, and that really was based on thinking about a new union structure that would, I guess I should be looking at you, gosh. Um, that was a union structure that was built like a network so that you would join and be part of a network as opposed, to, because freelancers are working all over the place. So anyway, that sort of got me started thinking about DAOs. Yeah, I'm curious, was, has there been anything you've heard about with DAOs that where you think like DAO tooling could be useful for the freelancers union? I realize I haven't, hadn't asked this before. But yeah, I mean, I think mind. it's for, for, so for unions, cooperatives, I think that there's something that like where, where I feel conceptually is like the DAO world of what is being organized, call it sort of like 
discord unionizing, then you <laughs> kind of have like traditional analog groups and, and we're looking for the bridging. And I think that's, so I'll tell you some things where I think the DAO world is not getting it. So I kind of have been, because of our conversation, yeah. I've been thinking about it sort of like where Airbnb got things right in a funny way, because we can all have our criticisms, but the major point is that they had this insight that people already had infrastructure, and that you built on the infrastructure that they had. So very quickly, they became bigger than all these major hotels. And I feel like the way that we're thinking about scaling DAOs is that we're gonna manufacture these communities. You know, we'll like, we'll just find some way. It'll be in the Discord channel, it'll be really easy. Like, they'll come together and it'll be great. And then it'll go to scale. And that's why you should give me this much money, investor. But the truth is that the smarter solution is to, for us to start to look at these existing communities that are like seedlings that have popped out of the earth. They are there, they are functioning, there's some solidarity, and we should be like Airbnb, thinking about them as how we're gonna organize. And so to me, to put it in sort of business terms, like the, one, the businesses that will succeed are the ones that understand that you, you expand on the community's trust, you don't manufacture it, and it's a summation of those groups, not hom homogeneity. Yeah, and I think that the, the trust factor here is something really interesting that I think DAOs would, there's a trust, there's a tr ability to leverage trust that the anonymity or pseudonymity of DAOs kind of creates a limit around the effectiveness or the, abil the number of like affordances or things that DAOs can do. And it seems like starting from a community where there is trust could uh, empower so many other types of actions that DAOs could suddenly take. I like really love the uh, the meme that uh, crypto has basically speed run the last few hundred years of finance, and we're now trying to speed run the last few thousand years of governance. <laughs> uh, and I think that there's some element where if you it, realize that like having trust, having relationships, having communities that you can start from and leverage and build uh, allows you to be much more effective in achieving your goals, yeah. right, even def eliciting goals from the population, aggregating them, prioritizing them, and then acting against them. And I, I, I think it's t it, there's a bunch of things in that. I think like one thing is, you know, first of all, I feel like the era of 2009 to 2022 is ending. You know, like we are, our stock market is, you know, having major difficulties. We are having significant worldwide inflation. And so we can't keep assuming that the market is gonna be like it was before. And I think that's really important because when you're talking to a community, that community has skin in the game because they want this to succeed because they're getting something for being in that community. And so it's actually a cultural change. And the cultural change is that you trust that community to understand what they want because they're grownups and they probably have a pretty good idea of what they want. And I'd say that's where both our politics and our business community are totally getting it wrong. So we feel like we are really smart, we are going to hire, and this is everybody, business, foundations, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. Like, we hire McKinsey, Bain, Dot, no offense, please say your management consulting firm, and then we find out what it is that we want by some data system and then we implement from above and tell people what they want. But that's, to me, the promise of DAOs. If we can start to get it right, is that we're actually having a community that's in control, and they're saying what they need, and we're architecting around that and iterating with them. Yeah, and I, I've, you've had a great take on the, the over-reliance on traditional sol solutions from the last few decades for both the left and the right. Can I ask you to go into that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. You know, let me just say, I'm like a lifelong Democrat, but so hear that. Like, I just feel the need to say that. But I think that it's really important that we understand that we have to have a community orientation. And when I say community, I literally mean an organization of people. If, like, you, you might say DAO like, but that we have to have an expansion of these kinds of organizations for our democracy because they actually are deeply rooted. 
but the role of government isn't to do it for those groups. We don't need more centralized government. We need more decentralized government that funds actively and builds this new sector. And so it's a very weird thing. It doesn't fit neatly within these paradigms. It's not, it, I don't think the free market alone works. It's evident that it doesn't. And yet, what you have to do, so, so those in the, the libertarian world, like, no, I don't, I don't think that, that works. I think it's this hybrid, and that's why I call that mutualism. And it's, if we went around the room and we all talked about whatever ethnic group we came from, as immigrants, everybody would tell you the name in their own language for a tontine or a lending circle, and everybody will have done it through their faith community. So to give you an example, the Korean community has, uh, and somebody here who knows better, jump on in, but you, through your church community, you, don't, you put money into a hat every month until it's your turn to get that money, and you take that money, and then you start your business. Every group does that. This is what we need to go back to and start building upon, because it actually works. It's decentralized, and communities run it. Yeah, I think it's amazing to realize that uh, after our conversation, I did, and thought about both some of the uh, some of the more uh, radical exchange dynamic, or like digital democracy type directions that tend to be uh, very focused on representation of different groups, different experiences, and I feel like that strongly aligns with this community built, like the idea that we should build communities, empower them to decide what they want, and then we'll incorporate that into governance structures. But it also connects very strongly to the uh, like crypto nation, uh, like a lot of the things that people who are pushing sovereign individual uh, type things are saying, like we should have the ability to opt into our own and create new governments. Um, it seems like it's basically just trying to drag either democracy or markets into this central idea that you should be able to opt into or out of these different organizational mechanisms. And it was remarkable for me to realize that like, you've highlighted exactly that these organizational mechanisms have existed in community forms for hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one thing when I listen to people talk, particularly in the technology world, and they talk about self-sovereignty, it is very much this idea of the individual is coming to this place to make a decision and can easily leave. Just learned about rage quit two weeks ago. And, um, and but, but it's, it's a good reaction, and I understand why somebody might have an orientation around libertarianism when you see how we're getting so little done in this country. You know, in a democracy, it's frustrating, but you can't stop there because it, we, have to, we have to function in a, in a more sophisticated way. And I just can't help but say, so my hero is this man named Sidney Hillman, and he was the president of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union. And what he did is he had collective bargaining with the companies, but then he took some of the dues and he became his own venture capitalist, though that no one used that term. And they then invested and built labor insurance, labor um, insurance companies, banks, housing, and literally the modern system of remittances to send money back home came, they, they invented that. So it's actually extremely sophisticated. It's actually not like homespun. Yeah, and I, I wanted to dig into a little more of the differences between uh, those business creations and uh, existing venture capitalists uh, and the idea, or venture capitalists and uh, entrepreneurs. I you'd mentioned that there's. Uh, like the one large distinguishing factor is that a lot of these things, spin outs from unions were to generate public goods or commons and, or I guess to some extent member goods um, yes. or club goods rather than being these for generalized open, like uh, permissionless for profit entities. Is that yes. how? Yes, yes, totally. No, thank you. That's such a great question. Essentially, it was so remember I said we'll start with the three principles of mutualism out of context. So the first one is community. The second is economic mechanism, but the economic mechanism, the purpose is not to extract the money out, but to recycle it back in. 
And, and that's what they did in a really sophisticated way. And I feel like there is some interesting opportunity to imagine the generation of some currency token the, have the equivalent of gas fees and the need to buy in and have membership and to like web three eyes all of this and as soon as you start doing that i think that there's also interesting ideas from modern monetary theory where like what happens when every union can be a sovereign currency issuer where you have something that looks like tax but then you can uh, think about what it would mean to uh, create or drive or uh, mitigate inflation of the goods created by this community and the number of levers that you now pull as a sovereign currency issuer just as an organization. You know, I think that's a really good point of the really good conversations that we can start to have, right? Like it kind of sounds a little outer space, but it also really sounds like there's something something that could be in there. And I think that's really the opportunity right now is that if we can start to realize that this isn't quaint or charming, you know, it's not, um, you know, Birkenstock wearing, like, dismiss it though you secretly wear them, you know, it's like, I think there's something here and we're ready for really creative conversations. Um, and I, I, I think that that's what's so, that's what's so interesting. You know, I, I kind of feel like we're at that moment, like, you know how when you hear like, what came before Silicon Valley? And it's like, really, it was like a lot of people in hate Ashbury tripping, right? And they were like talking and sharing information. So like everybody grew more because it wasn't attached to returns. And then we started investing in the schools, in the great university systems. So by the time we got to the place where people were making their investments and making money, there had been like a lot of other non-market activity that really made that happen. And I kind of feel like that's where we're at now. And sometimes the pressure to have to like, you know, get your deck and be ready to get your A round and B round, you know, it's kind of gonna kill things but because we have to find that place to maybe not trip like in hate Ashbury, but like do legal cannabis, it'll be here soon, right? But like do something where we, we connect to one another in non-market transactional ways. And I'll just say one thing also, that's the beauty of mutualism is like if you think about any natural disaster anywhere, the first thing that happens is people come together. They're starting to use technology to be able to coordinate, but where they physically meet is in the credit unions, the churches and the union halls, because that's where there's an edifice that they can go and they start to coordinate. And I think that's kind of both metaphorically right and it literally is right. And I think there's also a huge opportunity for uh, like non-geographically centralized organizations like this. One of my favorite stories from the pandemic is that um, there were a few like Slack servers and Discord servers where the researchers working on cutting edge things got together and were sharing all of their preliminary data because they knew that time was of the essence. And I think a lot of the breakthroughs can be traced to collaborations that showed up on there that was this para-academic system that did not exist through existing like normal channels because suddenly the incentives were not the systemic incentives of academia around grants and publications and citations. It was around trying to address this global problem that was growing worse by the week or by the minute. No, at that time. I, I think that I, I, I really love that point because, you know, I think we're at this time, I don't know about you, but I, I suspect like we're all feeling like we, we want something greater than ourselves. You know, we, we want to stop just being critiquers and want to start building. And the existing, the existing groups that we would join that have a lot of face time in the media, like the political parties, seem like they are not, set, repre not sufficiently representing any individual group. And so you see a lot of uh, momentum building around things like ranked choice voting that might break us out of a two-party system that leads to perverse incentives around representation. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you get the leaders you deserve. And so I think that we have to start to build, right? And say what we need. And I think then we will feel like we see ourselves a lot more in, in this. 
And um, yeah, so I, I think that that's it. And I think there is something about building. And I think if like if like we were thinking about what can you do, it's like what can you build and how can you start to make this happen? Yeah, are there any groups in the world that you think would benefit from uh, forming a new type of union or organization that maybe couldn't like has difficulty or had difficulty previously because they had pro like uh, barriers they had to surmount around finding each other or getting together or communicating or coordinating that maybe they like organization around DAOs might facilitate. I feel like uh, digital art might be one. Well, I think the like creators are probably the first group that has a model that you can explain with common sense and understand it. And it's not like people just wanting to move money around under whatever the radar. And that's a business model, apparently, or not. But um, I think that, but I do feel like there are these groups that are starting to form that are like there's Resilience Force, which organizes climate workers and there's um, coworker.org. So these groups are there. I think it's the bridging of the groups. You know, it's sort of like, I bet you after people organize at Starbucks and at Amazon, it's not gonna be very long before they start realizing that there's a DAO. And you know, if you're here trying to think about how you're gonna make a lot of money, like I think that's where the next thing is, is trying to reach those groups and helping them build what they need but it's non-market activity in the beginning because they don't have the funding to pay you. But that's probably where if you want to learn and do something good and feel good about yourself, like that would be quite interesting. Or organize your own place. Yeah, and I, I would hope that impact certificates might be an interesting way of tracking the contributions within something like this so that after the fact, if someone wanted to support the creation of this after the fact, they could come through and purchase impact certificates or use other mechanisms that we're trying to design in order to f fund that, s incentivize these kinds of things ahead of time or fund them after the fact. You know, I often think about like Facebook groups, like what's wrong with a Facebook group? Well, what's wrong with it is that you'll never get a notification that's like form your own group and you know, keep your own data and like get your own leader and leave this platform. And also you so can't do anything that's against Facebook or if you can, then they can always deplatform you. Yeah, exactly, and that's and so I think that is that is the point that it's actually the skills that you know how to do, or you could watch a YouTube video or just talk to somebody over fifty. But like, set an agenda, <laughs> you know, find somebody who or a group that will be the leaders, and it's not a bad word, and start to pass the hat around to support yourselves in your group. And I think that to me is the impact certificate because that's actually where you really see real impact. You know, we really like to see forests, right? We w and so we're like, we're gonna have a forest and it's gonna be big and it's gonna be big in three months, but the forest has to actually start growing by somebody planting the tree. And I think that's, that's the moment we're in. We're tree builders now. Yeah. and I. I would encourage everyone here who is like, has a tree in mind that you'd like to uh, incubate or plant um, to try and share that with as many people as possible. Um, and also commons at protocol.ai if you're having trouble uh, re finding or reaching out to people. Do you want to make an impact certificate? I, could, I couldn't figure out how to do it. So you tell me, what do you think would be the impact certificate? Uh, I, th I think that the, uh, the question becomes what scope of, like which, what work we want to include in it or not. Um, I think that like there, we could have an impact certificate of this conversation that people, if anyone found this particularly uh, engaging or interesting, we could mint and give it to them as uh, something that they could represent or present as a reference to, as an artifact to represent or uh, point to this conversation, or we could mint impact certificates for the, the generation or planting of some of these trees. So we'll do this like a cultural experiment. So take that. This is how I would, what I would say. I would say, wouldn't it be interesting to see if you could go around the room to see what groups people either s are in, or, and that could be your faith group, it could be your food co-op, like whatever that is, and then you could see what do you think you could do to help them. So in other words, you don't decide what they need. You say to them, what do you need? And then you help them do what they say they need. And then you see how many of them 
were here, then you learn. What did you do over the course of the year that was actually helpful or interesting or worked or satisfying or that you made money at? And then you came back the next year and you said, OK, we asked you this, we learned. And then we saw what those top five things were. We are going to now iterate. And then we're going to go to like digit fine coin whatever and get them to give us a grant to like help those groups. Yeah, I think that could be really compelling. Um, we have a few minutes left and I wanted to ask, uh, well, I wanted to also state that I've been very much enjoying Sarah's book, Mutualism. This is not an ad, <laughs> I placed ad, uh, <laughs> but uh, I've been enjoying it. I would recommend it's it. It's an unpaid as, ad. Uh, <laughs> I would recommend it as a source of learning more. Are there other places that you would, or recommendations you would have for people who want to understand more about the dynamics of labor unions, or um, the history of them, or places to have conversations with people who have, uh, I guess, like-minded people who would be willing to engage with and experiment with some of the weirder Web3 ideas, or the idea of incorporating new tools and experiments um, in connection with some of the more uh, traditional, robust, and uh, classical organization movements? Yeah. Um, well, one thing is that you can go to um, mutualistsociety.net, which um, just got its new URL about an hour ago. But um, so hopefully that's up. Um, but it's, uh, I would say, um, probably looking at t reading reading more about labor, just Googling around and looking at the history. Um, there are other people who've written really interesting books. Um, John Rostakis. I can, if anybody is interested, you can reach out to me and I would be happy to, to send it or send it to you and we can come up with a list. But um, Nathan Schneider is a great person. You should look at his work in Boulder, Colorado. Um, yeah, I think it's happy to, Share a list. Sounds great. Is there a way that you would recommend or encourage people to reach out to you? Oh, yeah. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. If I know that's like, what? But I really <laughs> will. Um, <laughs> it's like the only thing. Um, you, I'll give you my email. But if you want to talk to me, come find me so I don't do it up here. And I'll add some of those recommendations and uh, contact information to the PL Twitter. Oh, I do have something. There's a really great newsletter called Ownership Matters. And that is key, that is really a good place to look at interviews with other mutualists. That Ownership Matters is a good thing to look at. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Any uh, closing thoughts, questions you have for me or the audience that you want them to think about? Well, I mean, I feel like the thing that is on us is to start bridging this and starting not just for an intellectual reason, but because like the time is now getting right for these really interesting ideas. And so let's start having salons again, you know? Sounds great. Yeah, if you know of any communities who uh, are trying to organize, then uh, maybe finding like good tooling or ways, like venues that you can create, help create for them, or tools you can create for them, or if you are part of a community, um, I think there's a great direction of bridging those communities with existing movements um, and organizations to see if you can strengthen them and create totals that are greater than the sum of their parts. Perfect. Thank you all very much.